The Bob Murphy Show, episode 223. There's a tidal wave coming. What you gonna do? Get ready for another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. The podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. It's your source for commentary and interviews, conducted by a Christian and economist. Now here's your host, Bob Murphy. Hey everybody, welcome to an episode of The Bob Murphy Show. Today I'm going to be talking to Dr. David Legates, who is a climatologist and the specific thing we're going to be discussing is the revised and expanded third edition of the book put out by the Independent Institute called Hot Talk, Cold Science, Global Warming's Unfinished Debate. And uh, it was originally written by Fred Singer, who you may know, and then now it's billed as with David Legates and Anthony Lupo. Okay, um, so David will explain when we get into the interview here in a minute exactly what his role was and, and so forth. And you know, when did he join and how much of it is singers versus other people's? He'll, he'll explain all that. Well, let me just give you a little bit of a background on David's professional qualifications. So David R. Legates is a research fellow at the Independent Institute, professor of climatology in the Department of Geography and an adjunct professor in the Department of Applied Economics and Statistics at the University of Delaware. He received his PhD in climatology from the University of Delaware, and he has taught at Louisiana State University, the University of Oklahoma, and University of Virginia. He is former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Observation and Prediction and former Executive Director of the United States Global Change Research Program, and he has been a research scientist at the Southern Regional Climate Center, Chief Research Scientist at the Center for Computational Geosciences, and Visiting Research Scientist at the National Climate Data Center. Dr. Legates has been published more than 125 times in referee journals, conference proceedings, and monograph series. Also later on in his bio here, it says, Dr. Legates has earned certified consulting meteorologist status from the American Meteorological Society, and in 1999 was awarded the Boeing Autometric Award for submitting the best paper in image analysis and interpretation. The reason I'm stressing his background is, if you go in and look at it, and I'm partly doing this because I think it's funny, but also just, you know, so you guys know what you're getting into here. He is one of the the villains in the climate change debate. Okay, so just to be clear, I knew of David before this conversation, but this interview you're about to listen to is the first time I've talked with him. You know, we we're both affiliated with the Independent Institute, and that's how we arranged to have this discussion. But let me just give you, and, and partly I'm reading this because listen to how NPR talks about David and then listen to the conversation here I are about to have and see if if it sounds like NPR is giving you an accurate description of where this guy's coming from. So this is from September 12th, 2020, right? So not this recent September, but the one prior, you know, right before the election. So the title is Longtime Climate Science Denier Hired at NOAA. And NOAA is N-O-A-A in caps. And so here's the story. I'll just read some snippets of this. David Legates, a University of Delaware professor of climatology who has spent much of his career questioning basic tenets of climate science, has been hired for a top position at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. That's NOAA. Legates confirmed to NPR that he was recently hired as NOAA's Deputy Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Observation and Prediction. The position suggests that he reports directly to Neil Jacobs, the acting head of the agency, da 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 Legates has a long history of using his position as an academic scientist to publicly cast doubt on climate science. Again, so notice the framing here. He's against science, right? The NPR writer knows what the science is, and this guy who's questioning it, it's not just that he questions the findings of most of his colleagues. It's not just that his views represent an outlier in the field. It's that the way they put it, Legates has a long history of using his position as an academic science to publicly cast doubt on climate science. His appointment to NOAA comes as Americans face profound threats stoked by climate change, from the vast deadly wildfires in the West to an unusually active hurricane season in the South and East. Global temperatures have already risen nearly 2 degrees Fahrenheit since the late 19th century as a result of greenhouse gas emissions from burning fossil fuels. Again, it's amazing that this NPR writer 
knows those facts with such certainty that can just state it as if, you know, saying, hey, if you're running a fever, then your temperature is higher than 98.6, right? Like that's the certainty with which this NPR writer knows why the earth is warmer now than it was in the late 19th century. Warming is happening at the fastest at the earth's poles where sea ice is melting. Permafrost is thawing and ocean temperatures are heating up with devastating effects on animals and human humans alike. Let's see. Uh, they point out that in 2007, he funded a paper that, or sorry, he wrote a, was a co-author of a paper that was funded by bad guys. And let's see. Legates also appeared in a video pushing the discredited theory that the sun is the cause of global warming. Advocates who reject mainstream climate science, such as those at Heartland, the Heartland Institute, have had a leading role in shaping the Trump administration's response to global warming, including the decision to exit the Paris Climate Accord. And then last thing I'll read here is, uh, so this is a quote from someone they're interviewing on this. He's not just in left field. He's not even near the ballpark, says Jane Lubchenco, a professor of marine biology at Oregon State University and head of NOAA under President Barack Obama. Contrarians or science are welcome, Lubchenco says, but their claims have to be scientifically defensible. That's why official groups like the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change review the entire range of scientific research before reaching a conclusion. Okay, so I'll stop there. So that gives you a flavor of how this stuff goes and they'll give you context for the discussion, even including what research gets into the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports or the IPCC. So David and I will talk about that specifically. And again, as you'll see, you can kind of tell from my tone, David is not going to get on this interview and say, we need to reject science because after all, when you want to learn what's causing something, you just pray about it. And that's how you know, or you consult, but that's not what he's going to say. What he's saying is he thinks his colleagues in the science are wrong. And he says why he thinks they're wrong. Okay. So maybe he's right. Maybe he's wrong, but he doesn't reject science. This is ridiculous the way they frame this. One other thing near the end of our discussion, we're talking about the performance of the climate models. Like, you know, you know, if you looked at what did they predict in terms of how much global warming would they be going forward and then compare their, their projections to reality, how does it show up? And we were being a bit quick in the discussion. So in case you were intrigued by that and want to know more, I, in the show notes page, I linked to the article that I wrote up when I went and evaluated that stuff. So it's in the discussion with David, I get into it has to do with confidence intervals. So what happens is, They'll have these computer models that will make projections of, oh, this is what we think global temperatures will be going forward. But they could be, you know, there's natural variability. And so they have upper and lower bands around like the mean projection to say, oh, here's the confidence interval just to account for the fact that, yeah, we're not going to hit it right bullseye, but, you know, the 95% confidence interval. And so what what ends up happening is, the actual temperature, and this is not going to the Heartlands, this isn't going to the Heritage Foundation, this is going to the website of the people that say they have the mantle of the real science on their side. Their own charts that they think vindicate the models show that observed temperatures were lower than what they projected, than what the models projected. And in some cases, especially with the satellite data sets, for much of the forecast period, they're outside, they're below the, you know, the actual observations are below the 95% confidence interval. And so it's like, what else would have to happen for you to say these models are wrong? And also, last point I'll make is I was trying to explain to David, but it, it might not have come across well. The way they, they construct these things, it's almost like it, it flips the normal hypothesis testing in statistics class, right? You might remember this from high school when you studied statistics, that what you do is if you want to see, does this, does this thing over here have an effect on the variable of interest? You set up the null hypothesis, which says it doesn't have an effect. And then you look at the observations and you say, okay, could these observations be driven just by randomness? And this other factor over here isn't having an influence. And that's what the hypothesis test is for, you know, in the, in the standard approach. And so if you see results, and you're like, no, just natural chance alone. I mean, it would have to be a 5% or less chance that this result would be the outcome if this factor over here didn't actually have an, an impact, right? And so then you can reject the null hypothesis, the null meaning this thing doesn't have an impact and say, yeah, because the observations that we're seeing would only happen 5% or less of the time if this other factor didn't have something to do with it, 
right? So then you, you can confidently reject the null. But with these climate models, they kind of flip it. And it's like, oh, we're making the projection that here's what global temperature is going to be. And then if the actual temperatures aren't what we projected, but they're not way far above or way far below what we projected, then we're not going to reject the model. And so it's like the confidence interval in this case is used to shield them from being proven wrong. Or not proven, but from evidence coming in that makes it look like they're wrong. So like I say, it's in standard hypothesis testing, it's in a sense you're very confident that this variable has something to do with the outcome because you're rejecting with confidence the null hypothesis. Whereas here, the fact that observed temperatures are within the 95% confidence interval does not mean, oh, we're 95% sure the climate models were right. It's rather just saying they weren't so wrong that we couldn't say, oh yeah, if these things, that's what it is. It's like, if these models were right, we would only observe these actual temperatures 5% or less of the time. And in some cases, we can't yet say that. So we can't almost definitively say these models are definitely wrong. <laughs> so I don't know if I'm, I'm getting across, but my point is just because we haven't observed temperatures in reality that are outside the 95% confidence interval for these projections, that by itself doesn't mean, therefore, these models are crushing it. And as I say, it's even worse than that because with the satellite data, the observations are below the 95% confidence interval for most of the forecast period, at least when I looked into this two years ago. So anyway, all that stuff is explained in my article. If you want to read more, go to bobmurphyshow.com slash 223 for the links. But for now, here we go with my discussion with David Legates for the revised and third edition of the book put out by the Independent Institute titled Hot Talk, Cold Science, Global Warming's Unfinished Debate. Well, David, welcome to the Bob Murphy Show. Thank you for having me. So uh, I will have already given a little bit of an introduction to your background, uh, you know, in this in the snippet going into this episode. But for people who just skipped right ahead and they wanted to get to the meat of it, can you just explain your background and, and how is it that you came to be involved with uh, with this this new book from the Independent Institute or this new edition? Yeah, well, um, let's see. I was I've taught uh, at the I'm a climatologist by training. I really wanted to be a weather forecaster, but back in the '70s. I was told that weather forecasting was going to be done by computers uh, in the 80s and beyond, and it really wasn't where the excitement was. But in 1978, at least two famous climatologists who I didn't know were famous at the time told me, you need to get into climate change. That's going to be the big issue in the 1980s and beyond. And so that's sort of where I am. So I got my degrees from the University of Delaware. I went to the uh, University of Oklahoma for nine and a half years. LSU for a year and a half. I did a sabbatical leave at the University of Virginia. And then I wound up in 1999 back at the University of Delaware, where I will be retiring in January. Okay, great. And and then the, again, for people who missed it. So the, the book that we're focusing on is Hot Talk, Cold Science, Global Warnings, Warming's Unfinished Debate, Revised and Expanded Third Edition. Yep, and David's holding up yep. the copy for those who are watching the video of this. And I, I liked the uh, Arthur C. Clarke, for people who are like, wait, who is that guy? He's the author, among other things, of 2001. Yeah. Um, the, the front blurb they got in this says, hot talk, cold science dares to point out that the emperor has no clothes. So that's that's good uh, endorsement from him. So how did you get involved with, and it's from the Independent Institute, how did you get involved with that? Because it's it was originally Fred Singer, right? Was the Right. Yeah. Fred wrote the first version of this back in 1997. And I mean, I, I won't go into Fred's history. He's, I mean, we could spend a whole hour talking about Fred and his life history, but Fred is a quintessential scientist and po uh, political type of person. I mean, he worked with the National Weather Service. In fact, he was the, in 1962, he was the first um, uh, person to develop the U.S. National we uh, Weather Satellite Service. In fact, he developed a satellite that in fact, had we paid attention to him and put it in orbit, we could have beat Sputnik. Mm -hmm. And rather than had uh, just, you know, the, the satellite beat back where it was, he had the idea that we measure cosmic rays and things like that. Um, he was born originally in Vienna, Austria, uh, and escaped sort of Nazi Germany. Uh, and like I said, it goes on and on. But Fred is eventually in 1997 wrote this, the first version of this book, which is a two-part book. So the first part is Hot Talk, 
So he talks about the politics of climate change. And the second half is cold science, hence the title, which is the science of climate change. And so given that he's a scientist, but he's also been involved with the um, with the National Satellite Service, he was involved in a number of other positions within the federal government. He is one of the few people that can talk about the politics and the science uh, very equally. So in 97, he wrote the first book version. In 99, he wrote a second version. And he always wanted to write a third version, but just never got around to it. So uh, in 2019, 2020, he wrote the updated third version. Um, uh, it, Fred was nearing the end. Uh, his mind was there but the body wasn't really willing. So he had various people do transcriptions. And so they called in uh, Tony Lupo and I um, to essentially read through it, find out, you know, make sure it all makes sense that the, the people writing it down wrote down things that made sense. And there were a couple of places where Fred wanted some analysis done because uh, he just couldn't do it himself. And so we did that. So it's not really that we're co-authors. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, you know, Fred Singer with the two of us. So this I is see. Mm -hmm. Fred's idea, but we're there to sort of provide some quality control just because um, there were a lot of people trying to help him in his last days uh, to get this book finished. Okay, great. Um, so a, a lot of the, the people who listen to my podcast know that I've spent a lot of time on like the economics of climate change. And I have just repeatedly pointed out that I don't need to be quote a denier or, you know, going to the heritage foundation or something. You just need to read the UN's own stuff or the Obama administration or what have you. And you can just see that this, you know, the, the, the more apocalyptic proclamations are not borne out by at least the economics peer review literature. Um, and in particular, William Nordhaus wins the Nobel prize and that's announced the same weekend that the uh, IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees Celsius of, you know, comes out and his own model shows that even if just limiting things to two degrees Celsius would be worse than doing nothing, <laughs> you know? And so it's, it's pretty amazing. So since I have you here though, like let's now, so I, I was given advice like this when I got into this area, we had some media consultants and, you know, one of the things they told me up front was, you're an economist, you're not you know, a natural scientist, so you do not touch that stuff with a 10-foot pole because you'll lose credibility and blah, blah, blah. And that was fine. Like I said, for the points I wanted to make, you know, I didn't need to say, and for all, you know, the science is unsettled. So but so we have you here, though, to really give us, you know, an sure. assessment of that stuff. Um, so that's maybe, funny. what's that? Go ahead. Just, that's funny because in on the other side, you get lots of people with backgrounds in biology and uh, economics and number of things that, uh, will openly espouse uh, statements on climate change when they're not really supposed to or not really qualified right. to do so. Right. But doesn't bother them at all. Yeah, exactly. Or even like to to do the exact mirror image, someone will say, you know, someone who is, uh, you know, a legitimate climatologist where will then say, and that's why a carbon tax is a good idea. Yeah. And it's like, well, yeah. you're technically, you, you can't say, you know, you don't have <laughs> the, the, even the, the tools yeah. to say that. But in any event, so we'll put that aside. So, it, I do want to delve into the specifics of, of this uh, volume, but maybe just for the listener, can you give your 30,000 foot assessment? Like if somebody says, Hey, is this, you know, is the science real or not? Or is, is global warming real? Or, you know, are humans responsible? Like what's, you know, if you had to give like a quick, and I'm, that might be an, an unfair question because it's so big, but what's your immediate way of framing, you know, your position? Well, that's usually the way, the way the questions are phrased is, you know, is is global warming real? Is climate change real? And the answer, of course, is yes. Mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of like I always say, you know, if you ask me the question, are UFOs real? Well, the answer is yes, but that's not really the question you answered. I mean, if we go out tonight and you see something above that's moving and we don't know what it is, it's an unidentified flying object. It could be a plane going into Philadelphia airport. It could be the International uh, Space Station. It could be anything. Mm -hmm. um, so the same thing. Has, has the Earth warmed? Yes. So global warming is real. Has the uh, it does climate change vary? Well, of course it does. It's always climate always varies. So climate change is real. But that's the real the 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 bait and switch is when you pretend that question meant that are we getting disastrous climate change due to human activity? Right, right. I think that specific question, the answer is no. 
We aren't seeing more hurricanes. We're not seeing more floods. We're not seeing more droughts due to changes in the climate. We are seeing more floods and droughts, but it has to do with land use change. Now, that's a human impact, but it's not a climate change impact. It's a change in the local land surface. And so in particular, there are things that are happening that aren't related to climate, but are always or seem to be played off on as climate change. But I think when you start to look specifically at what happens in terms of climate change, what have we seen, we find that a warmer world tends to be a, a better world for a number of reasons. Um, civilization develops better under warmer conditions than colder conditions. Plant and animal life does better under warmer conditions and colder conditions. So I'd rather have a slightly warmer world than a colder world. And at the same time, what we often see is that the extremes of weather become less under warmer conditions and under colder conditions. Okay, great. And all right, so let me just ask you then, and I like the way you, you phrase that, that you're right. When people, it's it's sort of a, a bait and switch, or now the term is Mott and Bailey. I don't know if I'm pronouncing okay. that correctly, but that's the one that you, where it's, you know, um, it, it's sort of like saying, you know, do, oh, do you support feminism? And if someone says, what do you mean by that? Oh, just, you know, that women should have the same rights as men. Oh, yeah, sure. And then it's like, oh, and so that's why we should just have unisex bathrooms, right? You know what I mean? And so it's like, wait a right, minute, what, what right, do you right. mean? And so they, exactly. they say one thing and then flip it. So you're right. It is climate change. All we're saying is that, duh, 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 you know, this is pretty standard stuff. And then they mean, and that's why we need to ban, uh, you know, gasoline powered cars. Yes. Um, so, do, but point blank though, do you, do you think it is true that human emissions of greenhouse gases are responsible for um, a significant portion of the measured increase in average global temperatures since 1750? I think it's a minor player. Okay. I think the bigger game in town is the sun. Okay. Uh, we can see more variability in temperatures on the Earth's surface based upon variations in solar output than we do with carbon dioxide. That's not to say that carbon dioxide has no impact whatsoever. Um, and usually the people talk about, you know, when you've got no greenhouse gases, we'd be 30 degrees Celsius colder than we are right now. But the idea is that most of those absorption bands are, uh, are already filled with carbon dioxide. So at this point, a little more carbon dioxide doesn't make much of a difference. It's sort of like if you went outside on a real cold day and laid down uh, on the ground, you'd be cold. So you put a small blanket over you, you'd be a little bit warmer. You put another blanket over, you'd be a little bit warmer. At some point, continuing to put more and more blankets has no additional residual effect. And I think we've gotten very well close to that end, that a little more carbon dioxide has a change. I mean, a doubling of carbon dioxide now from most assessments is somewhere about 0.9 degrees Celsius warming which is relatively trivial compared to everything else we've seen in terms of variability in the climate system. Okay, now, and this obviously doesn't reflect on the underlying truth of it, but just so the listeners have some context for that, the, the theory that solar activity is um, more influential in explaining variations in observed Earth temperatures compared to anthropogenic uh, emissions of greenhouse gases, how popular is that view, would you say? Well, essentially, a number of the, you know, the IPCC, for example, does not want you to hear that mm -hmm. because we can't, we can't legislate the sun. Right. And so that's the issue. And in fact, I was at a uh, congressional hearing uh, about 15 years ago, and Michael Mann from Penn State University was there. And I think it was Senator Leland Vitter that asked him the question, said, well, if water vapor is the most important greenhouse gas, why aren't we worried about water vapor? Why are we worried about carbon dioxide when it accounts for only about 20% of the greenhouse gas, of greenhouse warming relative to what we see with water vapor? And I thought man would give sort of an explanation saying, well, water vapor turns over very fast. It's, uh, you know, it, it, the, the entire planet uh, rainfall total equals the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere uh, over the next nine days. So it doesn't last in the atmosphere very long. But in fact, what he simply said was, well, we can't legislate water vapor. And I thought that was very telling because, mm -hmm. yeah, we can control carbon dioxide. And that's why we're doing so, even though it's a minor player in climate change. And it's a distant second in terms of effects on, on the Earth's climate. Okay. So, um, so I, and, and, and that's, uh, 
good to explain. There's institutional reasons that maybe some scientists who secretly believe that, oh yeah, the sun maybe is a big role, but they don't want to stick their necks up. But in terms of just obser- observations, is that the theory that the sun is the primary driver? Is that a, a relative minority viewpoint? And you can define the relevant, you know, field. Now, of I have a friend of mine that's an astrophysicist from Harvard. Mm-hmm. And it's one of the things he's been able to look at is temperature fluctuations and something called total solar radiance. It's mm-hmm. how much energy literally is coming off the sun being received at the top of the Earth's atmosphere. And there's a delay of about 11 years, which you would expect the Earth takes a while to start to warm and cool as a, as a result of external forcing. But at the same token, you can see the sun's re- of fluctuation in the temperature record. And that's one of the reasons, the arguments why we've been warming over, say, the last 150 years is we went from the longer minimum where sun's output was much less in the mid, mid-1850s and we've gone to a uh, solar maximum uh, where we've had more solar output, and accordingly, the temperature of the Earth has risen. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm trying to remember. So I haven't kept up with it, but back when I really w- went through large portions of the IPCC's reports, I, w- I think it was, it would have been the AR, I want to say the AR3 um, is the one that I really went through. But it was interesting when they were doing the attributions and, and at that time, it, the, the way their, the rhetorical thrust of the argument was, was something more along the lines of, you know, well, we have time series on uh, emissions and solar irradiation and da, 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 and, and, you know, and the measured global temperature. And if we just use the, the solar stuff, we can't ex post fit the curves as well as if we also throw in the emission and they get to adjust the dials for the sensitivity like ex post. And it was sort of like, well, in general, yeah, if you give me another data set that's independent from the other one and give me the flexibility, then I probably can get a closer fit. But it it was pretty interesting just like to step back away from the the science and just look at rhetorically how they were arguing. See, so it can't just be the sun. It's got to be this too. Right. And the other problem is they focus a lot on um, sunspots. Mm -hmm. So sunspot has this 11-year cycle, and historically humans have been, or as climatologists, have been real interested in that 11-year cycle, and can we see that 11-year cycle? Because it's easily measured uh, and observed back to the 1600s from the Earth's surface. But the problem has been that that doesn't necessarily equate to the solar output, and that's why total solar radiance uh, is a much better output. We just can't go quite back to um, 1600 to measure that. We don't have instruments that well mm-hmm. uh, that exist that long. Right. Okay. All right. So I I'm, want to just touch on some of these things. I'm just looking at the table of contents here. I had looked at this earlier to, to flag some of these. So in um, chapter one, there's a subheading warming or cooling. And so, you know, and so this is a, a popular, uh, point that the, again, it it ends up being political. So I'll just go ahead and and just acknowledge that, that people on the right who are against a lot of the government action in the name of resisting climate change will bring up and they'll say, whoa, 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 now all of a sudden it's global warming. But back in the seventies, people were warming up or warning about global cooling. And then I've seen, you've probably seen this too, David, that there's this, the the response to that is to say, oh no, no, that's a right-wing myth it was only one or two scientists in the 70s who thought that, yeah, Time Magazine may have, but whoever said Time Magazine was, you know, representing the mantle of science, that's just a, a bogus right-wing talking point. Nobody ever really serious worried about global cooling. So how, what do you think about that? Yeah, no, I see, that's that's how I got in the business. I'm, I'm older than I look, I guess, maybe. But um, like I said, in the late 70s, I was graduating high school. And I came out and I applied to the University of Maryland and the University of Delaware and Penn State and um, because I'm here from the East Coast. And so part of the issue was that that was the mantra at the time, is that we may be headed into the next ice age. There wasn't a lot of funding associated with it, so there weren't a lot of people doing that kind of research. But nevertheless, that was the belief that, you know, we had we had enjoyed a warm period, but probably over the next you know, who knows how many thousands of years the temperature would slowly decrease. And we're starting to see that happen right now. And so that was 
this is sort of historical revisionism to say that no, um, only a handful of people were interested in it. It was always global warming. In fact, some of the thing, people like Stephen Schneider, who made a living off of global warming, essentially were arguing for global cooling back uh, in the 1970s. It just wasn't fashionable at the time. There wasn't a big push in environmentalism for it. And it wasn't until uh, temperatures started to rise in the 1980s. Uh, it could be tied to carbon dioxide and fossil fuel emissions that sort of the, the bandwagon started to run. And if if I'm not mistaken, David, correct me, obviously, if if you think I'm getting this wrong, but I think part of what happened was, so yes, they they saw, you know, global temperatures did start turning. Um, and so if the, in terms of the pure theory of, oh, human industrial activity, if that's driving temperatures, well, obviously human emissions of things were, was going up, you know, it was higher in 1975 than it was in 1875. And so that's why if you were going to blame humans on something and the temperature was dropping, it would have to be global cooling. And then I think the way later on, you know, the, the IPCC documents later would explain that as they said, oh, there's two things going on. One is yeah, the greenhouse gas effect, you know, from CO2 and methane and whatever. But then also in the 70s, there was a lot of just conventional air pollution, like smog, and those particles would reflect sunlight. And so, you know, it was, the two, and so that's why, you know, for that period. And so then they, again, so they had all these different dials in the regressions that they could just, you know, fine tune to X post get human activity to dovetail as closely as possible with the observed temperature changes. And then that's why they would say, ah, see, you know, we, we can fully, and, and that's what magnified the effect of the greenhouse gas emissions in terms of them ex post fitting the curves, because right. now they had to, in other words, they had to say, oh, it's really the greenhouse gas emissions should have made things really hot in 1975, but it wasn't. And the reason was because there was all the conventional air pollution that was reflecting sunlight. Yeah, And so like, that's how they had the, you know, two gross effects that were partially offsetting as opposed to, well, maybe actually, you know, human emissions just don't have that much to do with it. Yeah. But see, most people don't remember there was big plans for going up to the Arctic and putting a lot of soot over the um, ice, uh, change the albedo. So we absorb more energy. Um, I'm glad we didn't get into those kind of engineering plans, but uh, those were the kinds of things that were being discussed. Because, you know, even though carbon dioxide is going up, temperature is going down. And so if we weren't putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it would probably be going down faster. Right. And we need to come up with a solution right now. Yeah. Because, you know, as as they were saying back then, but more so now, you know, we only have 10 years to, to react. Uh, so it's got to all be done right now. And, and I would say that's one of the things this book has, right? It's just like a the litany of mile posts and, you know, Every 10 years, some prominent figure saying we have 10 years to act or else it's over and they just keep pushing back <laughs> the deadline. They tend to come out about the next election mm -hmm. and they're always four to eight years in length for reasons that make obvious sense. Right, but, uh, right. Okay, if uh, we can now move on to the hockey stick, because um, th this comes up a lot. So again, I'm trying to uh, give the background for people who, you know, they, they like this stuff and they dabble in a little bit, but they haven't, you know, perhaps gotten five books on the topic. So can you explain what, what is the hockey stick? And then, you know, what was it was McKittrick and um, McIntyre McIntyre. Yeah. So I've, I've been a co-author with McKittrick, who's an economist for people who don't know uh, on these things. Um, but yeah. So can you explain what the hockey stick was and then what McKittrick and McIntyre did? Yeah, it's got one of the it's it's one of the reasons I got in trouble early on, um, and I testified in Congress with Mann, uh, largely over the hockey stick. The hockey stick was the idea. It goes back to David Deming, who was at the University of Oklahoma um, back when I was there in the '90s, and he said um, the the problem was when you look at the geologic record, there was a period in the uh, 19, 1500s or so, 15, 1600s, where the temperature actually went up and they referred to it as the medieval warm period. And then a period in the um, uh, early to mid 1800s, which was called the Little Ice Age. And it really, Little Ice Age is a misnomer. It should have been just a little cold period, but that doesn't have quite the cachet as Little Ice Age. And the problem that Dem Deming said is that there was an email that went around from a number of people saying, this is a problem 
because we show the curve of carbon dioxide and back then carbon dioxide didn't fluctuate, but temperature went up considerably in the medieval warm period and dropped in the little ice age. And it doesn't appear to have anything to do with carbon dioxide. How do we tie all this back to carbon dioxide? And so magically along comes Michael Mann and the, um, the hockey stick. And the idea of the hockey stick is that he went to a number of proxy records. Uh, proxies are where you don't have a thermometer, but you use a number of uh, indirect techniques such as tree ring analysis and things like that to be able to reconstruct global temperatures. And surprisingly, he had a flat curve uh, that came out. And then at the end, he affixed the temperature record uh, uh, from thermometers. And so if you look at what that looks like, it comes along and then at the end it goes up. So you have sort of this hockey stick shaped graph. And the nice thing about the hockey stick, as far as they were concerned, is the medieval warm period disappeared, the little ice age disappeared. And if you plot underneath of that carbon dioxide, you see that about the only driver of temperature is carbon dioxide. Now, Bob okay. David. Let me, let me just stop you, Dave, just to make sure the listeners got them. I was going to paraphrase back. So Again, there was uh, the orthodox view of you know te previous temperature records, and of course, it wasn't that people in 1500 had accurate uh, measurements all over the globe. But for the best way they could do is it looked like there were pretty big fluctuations in global temperatures way before human activity was doing a lot in terms of you know cutting down trees and whatever, and or releasing uh, you know burning fossil fuels, and so it. It was for those who wanted to say the primary driver of Earth temperature changes since 1750 is carbon dioxide emissions. It was tricky. How are you going to do that? And so Michael Mann, who's a hero of the climate scientists who are, are interventionists in terms of their government recommendations, he came up with a new technique to use other types of records that we had, like things like on you know data on tree rings and stuff over time to yeah. come up with proxies, you know, theoretical things like, well, if the tree rings look like that, you could sort of, you know, see, to come up with an estimate of the temp global temperature series and that it was pretty flat for hundreds of years and then it just shoots up at the yeah. end and it looks like a hockey stick. And again, that ballpark mirrors human industrial emissions. And so therefore, yep, see, look at your own eyes. Just put those two yeah. graphs on each other. What do you think you deniers? Okay. Exactly. And so that was, that was the point, but, um, Part of the problem is the hockey stick becomes a, an apple and orange comparison. I mean, if you were to take the, the uh, proxy record and run that all the way out to 2000, what you'd see happens is that essentially it never comes up, that it runs still straight flat. And part of the problem is that some of these proxy records aren't responsive to temperature, but rather to precipitation. You can imagine, for example, some pine trees will grow better if they've got rainfall. And if it's a dry year, they don't grow. And they're not, you know, it's not the temperature limiting factor, it's the water limiting factor. And so that's why in some cases he got a flat curve. Uh, McIntyre McKittrick talked about principal components analysis and how essentially this analysis technique they used had a tendency to produce flat hockey sticks anyway. One of the points that um, we pointed out was that uh, if you go back to 1816, which is the known year without a summer, uh, it's when there were volcanic eruptions, um, Pinatubo and a number of others, that erupted, Pinatubo, no, Tamboro uh, erupted, and a number of them created a very cold period. It's, it's well in the record that in many cases the summer just um, virtually never happened. It was a very short summer period, and then we went back into fall and winter real quickly. And so you would expect that to show up in their record. And in fact, if you took the 11-year period around 1816, you'd find that 1816 was, in fact, if you ranked them, number six in line. There were five years warmer and five years colder. So what we demonstrated was that the hockey stick representation did not have the fidelity of pulling out individual years, and not even on a decadal time scale could it could it pick known uh, cooling periods, for example. And that was important because the hockey stick was used in, I think it was the third assessment report, to argue that um, 1990s were the warmest decade and 1999 was the warmest year in the last thousand years. Mm -hmm. Okay, so again, let me just paraphrase. 
So what man had done is he had came with these proxies because again, the, the temperature record, the observed temperature record wasn't that great when you start going back hundreds of years. And so he had the flat part generated via the proxies and his techniques for averaging them and doing, you know, statistical smoothing and so forth. But then once he got it to the period where we had reliable actual temperature records, then he switched. And so his graph, so when the, when on his graph, the hockey stick shoots up, it's not because his proxies said, oh, now according to this technique, the numbers should start skyrocketing. It's because he switched what he was plotting at that point and went to the actual historical temperature records. And so you're making two points. One is if you consistently used his technique for proxies, it would have just been flat throughout. There would not have been the hockey stick. So that shows, you know, so that's one issue. And then also you're saying, looking at the part where man had used the proxies to generate, you know, ex post, like the theoretical temperature, what it should have been, you know, using these proxies where we have major events that we know, oh, this was going to, this should have been a very cold year relative to the surrounding ones, but yet man's technique would not have flagged that for us. Like, you know, it it doesn't stand out. So like, we just know his technique is, is unreliable. And I think um, this is what you're getting with the component analysis. What McKittrick and McIntyre did specific, or one of the things they did was they just, I think showed using man's technique. I think they just randomly generated data and just fed it through and showed no matter what we input, notice his technique would just always generate a, a flat line. Right. So it's not that, right. you know, it, it could have been otherwise given what the data were. It's that the, his technique per se creates straight lines. And then he's like, Hey, everyone, look at my technique show that temperature was flat until humans came along. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and then to reiterate your point, why mm-hmm. you bring it up, that was so important to AR3 because that was the argument that the medieval warm period, the little ice age, they really didn't exist on global timescales. And we could now say that, yes, the temperature record matches almost perfectly the carbon dioxide input when clearly that's not necessarily the case because uh, H.H. Lamb did a lot of research and found out that the the medieval warm period in the Little Ice Age could be detected in climates from Novosibirsk in uh, the Arctic all the way to Tasmania in the Southern Hemisphere. So it it was global and not just local. Okay, okay. And again, the big picture is if we have these huge sustained changes in average Earth temperatures hundreds of years ago, then that leads us to wonder whether you know, it, it's the dry, the driver of what we're observing from the warming from 1750 to today is necessarily primarily due to human activity. Yeah. And that was Deming's issue was, you know, that there's a number of scientists saying, how can temperature fluctuate like this, but carbon dioxide doesn't. And then we turn to the general public and say, see, carbon dioxide is the driver of climate change. Well, it didn't cause it back then. Why do you think it's causing it now? That was always a stumbling block. So we got to get rid of that. Mm-hmm. Okay, another, your chapter six here is the climate gate scandal. And so here, um, that's the stuff with the emails that were hacked and whatever, right? Or re- or released, maybe hack's not the right word. Yeah, I think what yeah. was happening is that um, East Anglia was under a uh, requirement to possibly release emails. Mm-hmm. And so I think they were putting them together and they were just using a, a an open web server to be able to store them. And somebody recognized that started downloading them. And when the government finally said, you don't have to release it, um, nevertheless, somebody had downloaded the whole package mm-hmm. and could release it in the, independently. Oh, I didn't, I don't think I realized that part of the story. So it's that they had been, I don't know if FOI is the right term for what would have happened, but they were asked to turn them over and they said no. And it was only when they said no that the person dumped it to the... Well, that, yeah, because see, the, the argument is that the East Anglia had... Um, can you explain uh, what East Anglia is for the... It's list? the University of East Anglia, uh, UEA. Um, it's affiliated with the Hadley Center um, in England. And they have and some of the leading yeah, proponents. Yeah, Phil Jones and a number of other people there, uh, Ken Briffa and so forth, that were working on um, climate change. And so they were making data sets available. And so they had this open web server that you could use, a, what's called a standard file transfer protocol for FTP service. And so the thought was that somebody was using that because to get all the emails 
from all these different computers. They needed a central place to put them. And the easiest thing would be to just add it to a file over there on that web service. And so that somebody, while got on the web server, started looking around, saw this file being created, and just started downloading it. And when eventually the government said, okay, we don't, you know, you don't need to release it, that it was released that way. So I don't think it was a true hack mm -hmm. that somebody broke into the computer system because you're getting emails from a number of accounts, you're getting files from a number of different computers. Uh, it's it's far easier to say that was compiled into a central location and then somebody downloaded the central location rather than somebody hacked almost every machine at the university and looked around and stole almost everything there. It's just if you're asking too much to have one person break in and steal it, where it's more likely that they had put it all together and then it was it was grabbed because they weren't securing. It. Okay, so the. But for the for the benefit of the listeners, so what happened was this. I don't even. Do you remember, David? Was it? Did they send it to WikiLeaks, or where did they send it? Um, I think it may have predated WikiLeaks. It was okay. they put it out on the internet and had it uh, lock, and then gave the password out so you could download the file and unlock it. And um, okay, yeah. well, in any event, so this thing, yeah, so this yeah. thing is is uploaded and it starts making the rounds, and so, and of course, people who were skeptical of the you know, climate change hysteria and we, you know, governments need to take drastic action or we're all dead kind of thing. We're looking at this stuff and they were, and it was amazing because it, what it was folks, it's, it was like a lot of it was emails between some of the big guns in the climate apology world who were very much in favor of the, yep, it's primarily due to man-made activity and, you know, we need strong government action and anybody who tells you otherwise is in the pay of big oil, right? So it was like the leading academics who were pushing that line aggressively, seeing their private emails to each other, some of them sure seemed like it justified the paranoia and the skepticism yeah. of the others who are saying, no, this is a conspiracy. This They're trying to crush dissent. This isn't an open and honest scientific inquiry. And so what I've seen, David, it's, it's funny, like, so there was a backlash against the initial you know, response and, and all this stuff was stipulated. Like, like they didn't come out and say, these are fake emails. They said, oh, and so just to give you an example, they, the way Paul Krugman describes it, he's, oh yeah, and this alleged climate gate scandal that just showed climate scientists are people too. You know, meaning, no. oh, they all have their petty rivalries and professional jealousies. And, the, and that's what, what his summary was. Yeah, I read these emails. There's, there's nothing burger there. It, it was just climate scientists are people too. So yeah, I, what, what do you I say to that? What, what was in here that might yeah, help raise eyebrows? The sheer volume mm -hmm. of um, emails clearly indicated that somebody couldn't have been sitting down and... Uh, uh, creating them, but, you know, you just you just can't create that many emails. Mm. Uh, and, and in particular, they were being mailed to different people, and there were uh, some people outside the loop that could say, "Yeah, I did receive that email." So it was clearly indicated that this was these were real, not fabricated. Right. And um, yeah, there were some petty things that went on, but there were some interesting things too. I mean, for example, uh, one of the the key, and for, for example, I was in there. And one of the things we had done, uh, Bob Davis at the University of Virginia and I had written this article later on uh, Ben Sanner. Um, and without going into detail, the idea was we we um, thought that this was the third assessment report, I think it was. And essentially, we had talked about the fact that the line that he had entered in there, which was the preponderance of the evidence suggests a discernible human influence on the climate. That line came with two references that were his papers. So we took those papers apart, sort of like McIntyre McKittrick did, and we found out that essentially they were using a technique that just simply didn't work. And we can demonstrate it didn't work. Um, and so they objected. Hey, hang on, he wrote that for what, the IPCC summary? He wrote the paper, but then in yeah. the IPCC, this was the big scandal, right. was they had, see, the IPCC is an approval by government agencies. Mm -hmm. It's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So it's intergovernmental panel. It's not a scientific panel, technically. It's approved by governments. So they have to go through line by line and make approvals. Mm -hmm. They had approved this document. And then when the document comes out, there are other lines that had been in, inserted that hadn't been approved. And one of them was the sort of classic line that everybody was quoting, which was there's a discernible human influence on the climate. Okay. 
And the question was, how did that get in? And the argument was that came from Ben Sander. He had been told or on his own had added that in at some later date. So the issue then becomes, well, you know, we wanted to address based upon what he said, is that a reasonable assumption? And he had listed two of his own papers as the example. Mm -hmm. And so we looked at the papers and said that technique is inherently flawed. And in the ClimateGate emails, after we published it, Tom Wigley, who's at also at, um, was affiliated with the University of East Anglia, he was also on Ben Sanders' papers, wrote the editor and said, you should have talked to us first. We would have told you not to publish it. What we want you to do, essentially, is to allow us to publish a rebuttal as a new paper. We will slam them. You'll allow us to put it in print. And then you don't allow them to have any rebuttal to our paper, and that'll end it. And essentially, that's exactly what happened, except from our point of view, we were told, well, your rebuttal doesn't add anything, so we're not going to publish it. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until the release of these emails did we find that there was actually collusion between authors and, or scientists and editors to specifically in, exclude certain research from the uh, referee literature. Mm -hmm. That essentially allowed them to publish things, but wouldn't allow people to criticize it. Okay. And then two, two of the more famous ones, and see, see if you, and, you know, my apologies if, you know, if you don't know this one, <laughs> it's fine, but I don't want to just catch you off guard. But one of them was, um, I, I can't remember who, who the author was, but saying something like, okay, well, for this, you know, for the upcoming IPCC summary, da, da, da. And we want to keep these particular publications out in the way, if we have to, we'll redefine what the relevant literature is. Yes. Do you I, remember which one I'm talking about? I definitely remember what you're talking about. I think that may have been either Kevin Trenberth of the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, or it could have been Phil Jones from the University of East Anglia. But yes, that was definitely the argument is we will, we will keep certain papers out of the IPCC even if we have to redefine what we mean by uh, refereed literature. Yeah. So, and, and again, and the, the most you could possibly do, folks, with some of these is to just say, well, they must have been kidding. That's the only way you could yeah. say that, you know, these guys are scientists and they're not doing what the, quote, conspiracy theorists were saying they were doing, where they were actively trying to shield the public from you know, refereed reports that didn't support, you know, the alleged cons consensus. And then well, they, the other one, another one that was real. Sorry, go ahead, David. I was going to say they would have been kidding if, in fact, then at the end of the day, these other articles actually didn't make it into the IPCC. Right. So see, we, did, we didn't keep them out. We were just kidding among ourselves. But in fact, they did keep them out. Right. So that was the, the, the telltale was when it finally was published, they weren't there. Right, right. Great. Okay. And then the other big one that there's lots of argument is um, the hide the decline. Sure. So let me, okay. So obviously you fill in the thing, but here, let me just give the listeners the, the uh, poor man's version of it. So one of these, again, defenders of the, the alleged consensus and so forth said, oh, I, I had this, this nature trick, meaning a trick that I used in a paper I had written for nature to hide the decline, referring to past reconstructions of things. And so some people on the right erroneously believe that what that person meant was, oh, global temperatures actually falling and that's inconvenient for our narrative. So let me hide that decline. And so then the people on the progressive interventionist left said, aha, you idiots don't even know what you're talking about. That's not what he was referring to. So I think they're right that it wasn't that the guy was talking about changing a decline in temperature records, but still it was relevant and it, it was, it was a bit disconcerting the, the glibness with which he talked about, oh, this trick I used to hide the decline. Yeah, but and to some extent that it, it could have also referred to the idea that by doing the apples and orange comparison with the uh, hockey stick where you have proxies mm. and then you append the, the instrumental record, that hid the decline of the proxy record. So essentially, if, the, if you just extended it across, you got a flat line, but by adding that, you get a rise in here. And so that would hide that portion of the decline. The other thing that Willie Soon and I, uh, he said Harvard, put together was the idea that over time, when man kept redrafting this hockey stick, he kept changing how big that rise had to be. 
because he wanted to state that 1999 was the warmest year of the last millennia. And uh, under the first go round, he had an, uh, uncertainty bars, but they were only, in statistical terms, one standard deviation. And somebody said, well, you need to make them two standard deviations to be statistically consistent. And when you increase that uncertainty, now this didn't come up. So what Mann kept doing was just simply kicking up that hockey stick so it's a little bit higher. And we found a number of published sites where magically the hockey stick got higher and higher and higher every time it was published, almost like Pinocchio's nose growing over time. <laughs> uh, and the data doesn't imply that he should have updated it that way. It was clearly so we could continue to say 1999 was the warmest year of the last 2000. Mm -hmm. Okay. So again, just to underscore on the hide the decline, it's, do, do you remember who wrote that email? Uh, I don't, I know it was, it was, the, the phrase was something about Mike's trick. Yeah. So it wasn't Mike Mann writing it, but he was clearly in the loop. Right. And so if, if that hadn't have been an issue, he immediately could have stood up and said, no, wait a minute. Right. That's not what he did. Uh, okay. So, so it you. wasn't though that, that the trick referred to, it wasn't that they were, because again, folks, there was what's been called a, a pause in global warming. So as David said, like, you know, 1999 was a very warm year. And then from that point forward, there was a long stretch where global temperatures, you know, were just bound to just tread in water. And so, and, and people now sometimes colloquially refer to that as a pause in global warming. And so I think some people on the right thought that, oh, what they're talking about is they, they're trying to hide, you know, that temperature flatness in the no, actual no, no, observer. That and that's not what they were talking about. They were talking no, no, about something was, else. Well, that was after yeah. uh, the, the, um, the, the emails came out. It was after right. the, the pause, after the emails came out, after the uh, IPCC assessment. Yeah. This was all later. So it, it's unfortunate, though, because it, it did give the people who are trying to poo-poo this all as just a big nothing burger. They... They were able to make, you know, I mean, in other words, because unfortunately some people did misunderstand what that meant, then they were able to say, oh, see, you, you idiots on the right don't know anything. When yeah. it's like, no, they really were talking about, hey, we got to hide something here because otherwise it hurts our narrative. But, it, you know, what people thought they were trying to hide is a little bit yeah. off. It was in some cases. Off, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me see. What else would I? Oh, and you, and you had mentioned there the, the statistical significance, and this is something that I did some work on. When you, it's funny, Dave. When you go to, um, oh shoot, I think it's realclimate.org, but I might be wrong, folks. I, so, folks, it's BobMurphyShow.com/slash two twenty three. I'll have all the correct links here. I, I might be misspeaking off the top of my head, but real the, climate is Michael Mann and Gavin Schmidt. Okay, yeah. So that is the right one. So, and, and I think their catch line is real climate scientists or real climate science from real climate scientists. Right, meaning like not those yeah. frauds and charlatans that you know the right wing Might will, will yeah. usher. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, what's interesting is on their own terms when you go and like they had a thing, and I haven't been there recently, folks. But I don't know about five years ago, I really dove into this stuff and went through it on their own terms. When when they have like a thing, you know, like in their FAQ or something to say how accurate have the climate mod models been, and you click on it and it shows. Like, oh, as of this date, and then the, you know, the, the suite of cutting edge climate models as of this date and the projections they make, and it gives the confidence intervals. And what's funny, David, is, you know, so they're wide, you know, 95% confidence intervals, wide bands. And then the observed temperature in some cases was way low. And yeah. in some cases was flirting with that boundary or in some actually crossed it. Mm. And so I was just making the point that the the way the defenders of the orthodoxy are showing that is that they're trying to make it look like, yeah, see, everything's great. And I was saying, no, it's, it has to do with a weird way of the way they're framing like the, the null hypothesis and to reject yeah. it, that normally what you do with those statistical tests is you, you stack the deck against yourself. So you, re, you reject the thing that's not what you're saying. So you can right. say, really, there's, you know, only, a, you know, that there's only a 5% or depending on which, you know, two and a half or 5% chance yeah. that the thing I'm now saying is my belief could be due to chance, but they're doing it the other way around where they're saying, no, like the, not like our model, it had to be so far off yeah. <laughs> because do, do you get the point I'm trying to make David? Yeah, that, yeah. It, it goes the other way. Like the, the confidence interval is protecting them from being demonstrated to be wrong. 
it actually, right. like I say, in some cases, it it's still the, the lotus of the observed temperature was actually underneath their own envelope for the 95% confidence interval. But I, I don't know. Do you, can you, yeah. if well, you can get what I'm saying? Can, models, yeah. That's an interesting thing because one of the things I gave a talk recently in Las Vegas, and one of the issues is why climate models tend to run hot. What we mean by running hot is they almost always overstate the case. So if you take models and look at what's happening and then you compare them with the observations, they almost always suggest that by now we should have much more warming than we got. And I think it's it comes down to two things. One, back in 2017, there was an article in the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society that talked about the art and science of climate model tuning. And the idea was that for a long time, they led you to believe that what was happening is they put nothing but physics into the models. They would run, turn it into computer code. They would run the computer and whatever came out the other end must be correct. And now they admitted, okay, there are tunable parameters in here. And one of the tunable parameters is what's called climate sensitivity. How fast does the climate warm in terms of temperature when carbon dioxide goes up. And their estimates are on the order of three to three and a half uh, degrees Celsius per, um, per doubling of CO2. Independent estimates are generally down around one degree. So they've tuned the model to be more responsive to carbon dioxide than it should be. And the second component is effectively that when we look at what carbon dioxide is supposed to do over the next 80 years, the scenarios they run are extreme. Um, there's something called RCP 8.5, which is an 8.5 uh, watts per square meter of additional energy added to the climate system. Almost everybody agrees that 8.5 is not a business as usual scenario. It's an unbelievable climate scenario. And so that we really should have a forcing that's somewhere down around half that. So if you, but the problem is almost everybody in the literature uses the most extreme climate scenario because you get a bigger bang for the buck. You get a bigger climate signal out the other end, and it's easier to write the paper when you've got a big signal than to try to say, I've got a really small signal, and it may or may not be statistically significant, and therefore the paper doesn't get published. Mm. So when you combine the two factors that essentially the models overstate the sensitivity of temperature to carbon dioxide, and then they overstate the way in which carbon dioxide is believed to play out over the next 80 years, you combine those two, it's not surprising that the climate models run hot. Okay, so the, on the latter point where the, so again, folks, just to make sure you get what David said there, he's saying one thing is if we knew for sure what the emissions of, you know, or what the atmospheric concentration of CO2 and methane and so forth would be, then it's just, a, you know, it's a purely physical science question is to say, you know, what's going to happen with the evolution of the Earth's temperature over time, given, you know, that, that composition, if we, if we knew it ahead of time, what it was going to be. But then even if we did know that for sure, it's a wild card to say what are human, you know, in the year 2075, how many tons of CO2 is mankind going to emit? Well, we don't know. We, you know, we don't know what the population is going to be. We don't know what technology, you know, maybe there's going to be breakthroughs in solar panels and stuff. You know, we don't know. And yeah. that's a guess. So, you know, imagine if in 1900, people asked what's global emissions of CO2 going to be in 1950, they wouldn't be close to there. So there's, there's those two elements. But so David, my question is, um, you can kind of understand why they would be natural to, to lean towards the more aggressive scenarios. in the second part of that, just cause you say it, to get, to get noticed by the media, you got to have a, a, a scary result. Otherwise nobody cares. But on the first one, is it, how, how is it to explain? Because and this is stuff that I've seen in the in the literature too, um, where lots of people are saying, "Look at the the um, the estimates for the climate sensitivity to CO two are seem to be uh, overly sensitive, and there seems to be this great reluctance to revise it downward." And the IPCC, like they bumped it up in one edition. and then in the next edition, they walked it back, but they didn't move the whole thing down. They just expanded the range. Yeah, You know what I mean? So to keep the upper bar where it was, even though clearly the literature turned against them and they should have moved the whole thing down, but they didn't. So can Correct. you comment on that? Like, is that just they're being dishonest or is it they're mistaken or they're just so sure this has got to be the answer and it's such an important issue. They don't want to give ammunition to these deniers. 
Well, I don't want to attribute malice when um, it's probably ne not necessarily there. But what I will mm -hmm. say is, think about it this way. You've got a climate model and you've got a, tune a knob. Mm -hmm. And I can turn the knob to zero, which says carbon dioxide concentrations have no influence on climate. So you can triple a quadruple carbon dioxide, nothing happens. Or I can turn that knob so that I can make, you know, with a doubling of carbon dioxide, the earth will burn up. So the question is, where do I want to set that knob to be realistic? And what I'm saying is that based upon independent observations outside of modeling, we should set that knob somewhere around uh, 0.9 to 1 degree Celsius for a doubling of CO2. What the modelers are doing is setting it somewhere up about three to three and a half degrees C per, for a doubling of CO2. So they are setting the knob too high. The concern I have is not necessarily that we take a model, we set it right. The question is, if there's a knob at all, then it says it's all subjective. And as they argue in the paper, that knob can be set for a variety of reasons, which includes even the philosophy of the um, uh, the modeling group or modeling agency. So if you've got an agency that really wants to show climate change, you can turn that knob mm. up. Or if you've got one that doesn't want to, you can turn it down. My concern is this is a philosophy where the models really should not be used to say the future, because if it all comes down to what I set that, mo that knob to be, and I really don't know how to set that knob, then the output on the other end is simply meaningless or it's derived based upon something I have no, no rational way of figuring out what it should be. Right. And this goes back to what I was saying with how they dealt ex post with um, like the temperature trends in the 70s. Yes. That so, so folks get the because some people might be confused, David, and say, well, wait a minute. I mean, if they can just look and see, like you just have two time series, and you're just doing like a simple, you know, OLS regression isn't it obvious objectively what the sensitivity should be? But the issue is because they have different inputs. They're saying, no, the, the temperature is actually the result of many different forcing variables, only one of which is, uh, you know, carbon dioxide. So if they want to make the the beta or whatever you want to call it, the, the, the variable, the coefficient on that one bigger, they just have to make the coefficient on something else go the other way that happens to be there. So if they can say, oh, there was a lot of smog in the 70s, maybe that reflected a lot of the sunlight. And so had it not been for the smog, then the 70s would have been a lot warmer because look at how sensitive the earth is to CO2, whereas they might just be wrong. And maybe the earth's not that sensitive to CO2 and the, wasn't, the smog wasn't really a big factor. So there's different ways ex post you can fit the model because they got a bunch of different variables. And yeah. so, it's, so it's not that they're demonstrably wrong. It's just they're, they're fitting the curves. And the way in science... Normally, somebody would say, okay, you tested it. You use an out-of-sample test. You say, okay, yeah. what did your model think about something where you didn't know what the answer was already and then test it? And that's what I was saying. When you go and look at their own yeah. stuff at realclimate.org, it's almost falsified under their own confidence. And, <laughs> and it's, well, it's running, yeah. And, and that's why they're pushing to change the, the observational record. I mean, if you look at uh, a lot of stuff, uh, Tony Heller and I are working on a number of things with the uh, climate data. But a lot of times what they'll do is they'll take the more recent climate data and they'll increase its values and they'll take the older climate data and release it so you get a much greater warming. And one of the problems I have is I have a paper that I'm trying to publish on precipitation mm -hmm. that the, the criticism keeps coming back is that, well, the model, you say that this, uh, this jump in precipitation is due to uh, a change in instrumentation, but the models all say that there should be an increase in precipitation with global warming, so I think maybe your observations are wrong. At this point, it's weird because the model is validating the observations right. instead of doing it the way the scientific method always works, which is the models uh, or the, the observations uh, validate the models. Um, but that seems to be the fact that we put the, the cart before the horse uh, all the time in climate science. Okay, that's a critical point. Do you mind saying that again in possibly slightly different words, just that point you just made? Like, wh what are they actually doing? Like, what's the argument by which they're arguing well, something well, must be wrong with these observations? And then... let's, let's go back to temperature since okay. it's easier to think about. So the idea is we know that there was the... Um, uh, the dust bowl, let's say, you know, that's temperature. So there was a dust bowl in the 1930s. And so that was very warm conditions. And we can measure it in thermometers. And we see that essentially towards the end, we have a rise as well in thermometers. 
but part of that warming should be due to urbanization effects. I mean, think about Dulles Airport. When we created Dulles Airport in the 40s, we put Dulles Airport there because there was nothing there. And now if you know anything about D.C., it has grown ridiculously. And so Dulles is now surrounded by the urban heat island effect. So you would assume that it's warmer than it should be, not because the temperature has changed, but because the land use has changed. So if you were going to adjust for land use, you should take the warm conditions now and cool it slightly. Mm -hmm. What they wind up doing is going back to the 1930s and they lower those temperatures. And then they take the more recent values and they rise it. So you can imagine if you do that, you get an increase in slope, which says the temperature increase is greater. And therefore, that justifies effectively your model, which shows a much warmer conditions happening over time. So it's really going back to the observations and changing the observations so they match the models Mm -hmm. rather than using the observations to validate the models. And when the two disagree, then we go to the models and fix the model. And I imagine also because the climate system is so complex, if you have an interest in getting a certain result, you can find ways to do it without lying. Yeah, and these models are hugely complex, mm-hmm. so it's not like just one uh, multiple regression with five or six coefficients. It's it's a huge number of equations that take a long time to run, and there's there's many unknowns and many coefficients that have to be specified. So it's it's really a, a, a parameterized problem in that it's not just one knob or two knobs. You have a million knobs to contend mm-hmm. with. Mm-hmm. Okay, well... Um, I think we're approaching the end of the time I had asked you for, David. If I could ask you maybe one final question. So sure. w- what would you say to somebody, you know, they're listening to you and they're like, okay, sure. So I can totally believe you um, that the alarmism we see, it's not that everything just keeps getting worse. It's not that, you know, our way of life threatened and our grandchildren are all going to be underwater. Okay, but are, are, is, are we just lucky? Like suppose the science were to, to move a certain way, David, like isn't, you know, would governments then around the world be justified in clamping down on emissions? So is it just that you happen to disagree about the, the science? And, and also, in general, are you saying, therefore, governments should be doing nothing? Or, or you know, what if they just fund stuff just in case? You know, because maybe the, the science changes. You know, maybe 20 years from now, they'll realize, no, it is an issue. See, and that's, we haven't had time really to talk about the fundamental question because, Nothing responds to mean global temperature. The hockey stick is mean global temperature. Mm -hmm. The models we've talked about from mean global temperature. What kills the most people and has the biggest economic impacts are storms, floods, droughts, uh, things like that. So the question we have to address is, are they changing? Mm -hmm. And what we see across the board is that they're not. There are populations at risk, but in general, tornadoes are not increasing. uh, Thunderstorm activity isn't increasing. Uh, hurricanes aren't increasing, hurricane landfalls aren't increasing. You go down the list. Everything that creates the biggest economic impact and kills the most people are not changing. So then, I, you know, I, I come back finally to sort of this discussion that happened uh, in another um, um, another congressional hearing that I wasn't privy to. The, the, the guy was asked by one of the representatives and said, um, do you look both ways when you cross the street? A scientist said, yes. And he says, well, that's what we're doing is we use a precautionary principle. We're doing something now to stop what's going to happen in the future. And I said, the correct answer is we don't use a precautionary principle. We actually use the corollary to precautionary principle. With corollary says we do nothing until we can demonstrate that whatever we're going to do is going to actually have a remedy to the problem. And it's not going to exacerbate or create other problems. For example, if I go to cross the street, I'm not going to reach into my wallet, pull out a $50 bill and throw it in the air. I'm doing something. But by stepping off the curb, I'm going to potentially get hit by a car just as fast as if I did nothing at all. So that has no impact whatsoever. And the bad thing is, if I keep doing that and cross enough streets, I'm going to be out of money shortly. So the idea is we should only do things if we know they're going to have a fundamental impact and solve a problem that has been identified and that's not going to create other problems. And that's getting back to your economic issue, Mm -hmm. is if these these solutions, so to speak, are creating such draconian problems in economics, 
that we're all going to be, you know, going back uh, into the Stone Age, more or less, and living pre-industrial revolution. That is not going to help the poor. That's not going to, that's going to make us all poor. That's not going to help the poor. That's not going to help economic development. That's not going to help civilization. And so what we want to do is play a let's go slow, let's look at the science, but let's be honest about the science. And that's what I'm concerned about is that from a scientific standpoint, we have not been honest. And from an application standpoint, we should use the corollary to the uh, precautionary principle and not the precautionary principle itself. Okay, great, great. Um, Well, folks, go to bobmurphyshow.com slash 223. We've been talking about the revised and expanded third edition of the book, Hot Talk, Cold Science, Global Warming's Unfinished Debate. David's holding up. David, I really appreciate your time, and I think the listeners uh, learned a lot. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. You've just experienced another episode of The Bob Murphy Show, the podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. For more information and to subscribe to this podcast, visit BobMurphyShow.com.